Welcome to another episode of the Amazing Food and Drink Behind the Scenes series. Today, we're on a road trip. We're going to Dublin, we're going to Hope Brewery, and we're gonna meet the amazing Vim De Jong, who'll take us through the brewing process. See you there. Hi folks, I'm Vim, Vim De Jong. I'm the owner of Hope Beer here in Kilbarrick on the north side of Dublin. Today I'm going to show you and tell you a little bit about Hope Beer, uh, but first you might wonder why, what is a Dutch guy, Wim de Jong, doing in Dublin uh, running a brewery? Well, I have an Irish mother. I was born in the Rotunda here on the north side of Dublin, and uh, even though I grew up in Holland uh, supporting the Dutch national team, uh, I uh, came back after my studies and ended up uh, uh, living in Dublin. So in 2015, myself, my wife, and a very good friend of ours, Des McSwigan, we decided to start a brewery, and that's Hope Beer. So today, I'm really looking forward to showing you around the brewery and um, telling you a little bit more about craft beer. So come along. Okay, so here are the offices of Hope Beer. This is the, the nerve center where Des and I run the brewery from a sales and administration point of view. Um, we have Barack Obama looking after us uh, with everything we do and it's a little showcase of our beers and our prizes that we've won over the years as well. But this really is the boring part of the brewery, so let's go inside and show you where the real stuff happens. So here we are in the brewery. This is, this is where it all happens. Uh, our brewery uh, is a state-of-the-art brewery, and that was a very important part of the whole concept of our brewery. We chose German partners, Kaspari, who have been building breweries since the 18th century. And the reason to buy such expensive state-of-the-art equipment was that I'm not a brewer, so I wanted to make sure that the brewery was perfect. We also hired highly qualified, well-educated brewers to help us brew the beer. Beside that, we use top quality ingredients and test our beer all the time. So there is nothing left to chance in coming up with great beer. We also hired a top class design agency to help us with the packaging and the labels of our beer. So there's a quick shot of the brewery. Let's go into the packaging area now. So here we are in the, um, the packaging and finished goods storage area, but really it starts with our water filter system. 95% of beer is water, and uh, we use Fingal's finest tap water, but we run it through uh, a serious uh, water treatment system to make sure that we have the right type of water to use for a beer. So today we're packaging Pass If You Can. Um, we'll be doing that on our canning line. There you can see Phil is getting the canning line ready to go. We also have a bottling line here so we can do both cans and bottles uh, of beer uh, here uh, in, in this area. Once the beer is packaged we put it in our finished goods storage area and besides cans and, and bottles we also package our beer in kegs. Um, so to give you an idea that 50 litre a keg would hold about 80 or 85 pints. So normally in a brewer, when you come here for a brewery tour, I would now uh, take you upstairs to our tasting room to, to taste our beautiful beers. But this time, uh, our head brewer, Richie Hamilton, is going to show you and explain to you the process and how we actually make beer. Hi, I'm Richie, I'm the head brewer here at Hope, and uh, I'm gonna show you how we start the brewing process. Okay, so this is our mill. Um, I'm gonna put a bag of barley in. This is the base for almost all the beers we brew. It's a pale pale malt, malted barley. It's um, grown down in Hookhead and it's malted in a thigh. 
um, and it's what we use for most of our beers. So, uh, lift it properly. When we're brewing, I'm gonna be using about 300 kilos, maybe closer to 400, depending on the beer. These are 25 kilo sacks. So um, we've usually got a good few more of them lined up. Um, so this is the first, process, first part of the process. We put all of the malt into the mill. When it's all in, normally we do that the night before the brew. Um, that means when we come in in the morning to brew, it's all ready to go. So we're gonna be doing the rest of that later on for tomorrow's brew. Okay, so in this part of the brewery, we keep uh, the rest of our um, uh, malt for the beer. We also keep a lot of finished goods. This is beer that we just kegged this morning. We keep a lot of cans and, uh, and other packaging material. So most of what we put into the beer is something like what we call a base malt. It'll be a pale malt or a lager malt. But if we want beer to be different colors, like stouts or darker beers, we also use things called speciality grains, which are barley that's roasted to a higher degree. So I'll show you some of that. This is roast barley. It's roasted barley, as you can see, it's, it's much darker in color than, uh, than the normal grain that we used. And a little of this goes a long way. So if we put maybe only five or 10% of this uh, as our, in our malt bill, it would turn the beer very dark. So when we're making a stout, we'll use some of this sort of stuff. And we may use maybe up to five or six different types of grain in a beer, depending on how complex it is. Sometimes we'll only use one though, if it's a simple beer. Okay, so I'll show you a different type of malt that we use. This one is called Carapils. It's, uh, it's the same color as the base malt uh, that we'll make uh, most of the beer out of, but it still has a little bit of sweetness. So we use that to uh, um, increase the body in some of the beer. So all of the malts do different things uh, and we, it, it's, the recipe is all about balancing them and using different ones for different purposes. Okay, so this is where we keep our hops. Hops are a really important part in the flavor of beer. Um, these hops are pelletized, but normally when hops grow, they're uh, flowers. They're what makes the beer bitter. Um, they've got a bitter resin in them, and they've also got a lot of uh, aromatic oil, which give you both bitterness and aroma and flavor. Um, let's go into the brew house, and we can uh, look a little bit more about how we actually brew and talk a bit more about hops. Okay, so here we are at the brew house. Um, this is where most of what we do happens when we're brewing beer. Uh, Paul's brewing at the moment. This is his first uh, brew on his own today. <laughs> Very proud moment. Um, so I'm gonna talk you through the process of what actually happens when we brew. So we were in at the malt uh, room already where the mill is. This blue pipe has a chain in it. It transports the milled grain um, into what is what we call the kettle and also the mash tun. So the first main um, step in brewing is called the mash. That's where we add hot water to the grains that we've crushed. And it stands for about 60, 60 minutes to maybe even two hours, depending on the recipe. And all of the starch in the malt gets converted to sugar. The second main stage is uh, called the louter. We pump the malt, uh, sorry, we pump the mash into the louder tun. This is another uh, similar vessel, but the difference with it is it has a slotted, uh, what we call a false bottom, a slotted base. And all of the mash, which is basically like a porridge, um, drains out through here. So all of the liquid in the mash comes through essentially a strainer, and we slowly pump it back into uh, the original vessel, which is now going to be used as the kettle. At this stage, we have um, a sugary liquid, um, which looks a bit like beer, but it, it's essentially a barley water. 
Um, and then the next main stage is the boil. So once we fill the kettle with all of the liquid, we boil it for 60 minutes, 90 minutes, depending on the recipe. At this stage, we're gonna add hops. So Paul has his hops weighed out already. This is, um, this is an American variety called Citra. It's got flavors of uh, grapefruit. It's really, really pungent. Um, so I was explaining earlier what hops were. They've got, they've got a bitter resin, which gives you that back of the throat bitterness in beer, but they also have a lot of um, aromatic oils, which when you crack open a, bit, uh, a can of, uh, particularly an American IPA or, or those sort of beers, you get this big fruity, often citrusy aroma, and that all comes from the hops. Um, if we want the beer to be bitter, we have to boil them. If we want more aroma, we put them in towards the end of the boil or even later on in the fermentation. Once the beer is, uh, once the wurst, which is what we call unfermented beer, once that's finished boiling, the last main process, um, well, second to last, we pump it into a thing called the whirlpool, which is underneath this vessel. Uh, all that happens there is the wurst spins um, because of the angle that it comes into the vessel. It spins and any, uh, any material like hops and other things like that get forced into the center. So when we drain off that vessel, uh, we've got clearer liquid than we would have done otherwise. The last stage, um, which maybe we'll go down and talk about in the, in the, down in the, at the tank farm. So for the final stage, we've got our wort in the whirlpool. It should have separated out all of the solids at this stage. It's getting clearer. And if you follow me up to the uh, fermentation tanks, uh, I'll explain the final stage. So the last stage of our brew day is to get the hot wort from the whirlpool into one of our fermentation tanks. Um, now, the wort is still about 95 degrees in the whirlpool, but it needs to be down closer to 20 degrees for the yeast to do its work. So we put it through this, which is a heat exchanger. The hot wort comes through one direction, cold water goes in the other direction, they flow on different sides of a plate, and it cools down, uh, it cools down the wort to whatever temperature we want. Um, we attach one of our hoses, uh, later on, when we're ready to do this, this end will be attached to a tank and we pump all of the liquid through the heat exchanger into the fermenter, we add the yeast and that's the end of the brew day. After that, we just wait for the fermentation to happen. So the last stage of making beer is uh, here in the tank farm, which is what we call all of our fermentation tanks. Um, we put, our, we put our wort into the, into the fermenter, we added the yeast, and then we have to wait. It'll ferment for five or six days, depending on the beer. And then after that, the yeast will start to drop down into the, the cone of the tank here. And we will, every day we'll take a, a gravity, we'll take a sample, we'll check how much of the beer has fermented. We'll check the temperatures, make sure they're okay. And then we'll start to uh, pull any of the sediment that's come down into the tank off the bottom, that will be yeast, hops, things like that. At the end of maybe um, 10 days or so, uh, we might chill the beer. Chilling the beer down to uh, minus one allows more yeast to settle out. The colder it is, the more it will clear. When we're happy that it's clear enough, we'll do what we're doing here with a different beer. We're transferring it from the fermentation tank to what we call the bright beer tank. Um, bright beer is just the name we give for finished beer. And in this tank, you can see it's a little bit different to the fermentation tanks. It doesn't have the conical bottom because we're no longer pulling yeast off the bottom. It has this feature here is what we call a carbonation stone. Uh, it basically is a bit like an atomizer. We, we, we hook up uh, carbon dioxide to, uh, to the, to the uh, valve and we force carbon dioxide into the beer, which makes it fizzy. So at the end of all that process, the beer that's in this tank is ready to be packaged. So uh, it'll be hooked up with a hose into the canner or the kegger or the bottling machine and we package it that way. So at the end of the process, we've got beer in one of our two finished beer tanks. This one at the moment is full of beer and it's being pumped with this uh, flexible hose all the way into the canning line. 
uh, and that's how we transfer the beer to either the canning machine or the bottling machine. The other one is getting ready to receive beer into it. We've still got the beer in the fermenter. You can see it's hooked up with a flexible hose. The final stage for transfer is to remove all the oxygen from the tank and replace it with CO2 because oxygen is one of the main spoilage factors for beer. It'll make the beer go off much quicker uh, if it's in contact with oxygen. We fill it with, we purge it with CO2 and we aim to get it right down to maybe 150 parts per billion, which is very little oxygen left in the tank. We have a meter that we use to read that. Uh, once it's ready and there's no oxygen left, we transfer the beer under pressure and, uh, and it'll be also ready to be packaged just like this one. I'm gonna run in now and uh, help out on the canning line and give one of the guys a break. Um, but stick with us because we'll be up in the tasting room later on to look at our range of products, talk about how they're made, talk about the flavors. We'll talk a little bit about some things that we're planning to do in the future, some of our limited editions, um, and what's next for us. Okay, so you've had a tour of the brewery. Um, Richie has told you how to make beer, and now comes really the most important part of any brewery tour, namely to taste a few beers. And we're gonna not taste all of our 10 beers that we have, but we've picked a few special ones that, that we really like. Um, at Hope Beer, we have a core range of, of five beers. Four of them also appear in bottle, and one is only in can. But at every tasting, we always start with our wheat beer, and it is Richie's favorite. Richie? Yeah, I think it's, it's, it's probably one of our more uh complex beers. It's, um, it started life as a kind of a Belgian style sort of, we, we, we call it a Saison, but um, we changed it a little bit since then. It's still got the same characteristics of that style, which is to be dry and drinkable, a little bit spicy. Um, we still use a, a, a bit of a Belgian yeast in it that gives it quite a, a, an interesting flavor. And um, we, uh, we do quite an interesting thing with it. We add a tincture with uh, certain spices in it at the bottling stage, at the packaging stage, I should say. Uh, and that, they're, they're, they're reasonably subtle, uh, but we get a little bit of a, an extra kind of, uh, I guess, a point of interest from that. Um, and I think that's one of the reasons this one goes, uh, I'd say this one is our best um, food pairing, for me anyway. It's quite versatile. Yeah. The tincture gives it citrusy flavors. Yeah, we, so we use bergamot, lemongrass, lemongrass and juniper. And, juniper, yeah. and um, they're kind of, some of them are like gin and tonic spices, but yeah. the beer is also quite dry. So dry and citrusy. We sell a lot of this beer in, in Holt, in the, in the harbor, where there's a lot of fish restaurants and the beer goes really well with fish. I've even had it with oysters and it's, it's better than Guinness yeah. uh, with oysters. So, so let's have a taste. Cheers. Cheers. Hop On has become our most popular beer. Yeah. Um, it's, a, it's a session IPA, 4.3% alcohol, so it's easily drinkable. Um, it, uh, the, 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 the taste and the flavor appears to a lot of people who like craft beer. Um, but unlike a lot of other craft beers, it's, it's not one that you can't have more than a pint of because it's too strong in alcohol. Yeah, so the idea of, it's, it's, it is an IPA, and you know, India Pale Ale, it's, it's the backbone of the craft beer revolution, I suppose, if you like. It's, it's, it's a traditional English style, but as we brew it, and as almost everybody brews it now, except, except the English, uh, <laughs> um, it's, it's very much an American style. It's something that the Americans took on and changed. Uh, they used a very distinctive type of hop that they grow in America, really citrusy. This beer has a huge grapefruit uh, nose. Um, so it's a huge, big hoppy style, but we call it a session IPA because traditionally, or at least a lot of the American style ones might be six, seven, you know, they're strong in percentage of alcohol and you can't drink very many of them. We've kept this down at 4.2, 4.3 and uh, uh, it means it's a lot easier to drink without having the consequences. I, IPAs make up 50% of the craft beer category. So it just goes to show it's not, it's not surprising that this beer is, is, our, uh, yeah. is our most popular beer. Uh, but this, the, the nose is fantastic. Yeah, so, so this is a perfect example of the dry hopping technique that I was telling you about earlier. Um, 
we use we use for for uh, for about 4,000 liters, which is what, what we normally have after uh, brewing twice into one of those tanks, we can put up to 50 kilos of hops directly in the top. And um, it also means it makes it quite an expensive beer, but it's really worth it when you smell it. Um, hops are expensive, um, but they're great. Well, these hops are. These hops, yeah, a lot of yeah, American hops yeah. are expensive. You know, they might be 30 euros per kilo. So it, it ends up being a lot of uh, money they the pretty beer. much all come from Oregon and uh, Washington exactly, State. Exactly. Yeah. So, so yeah. We, we, we have a we have a supplier here who gets them directly imported from a farm in in, a, in in the Pacific Northwest, and that's that's where almost all the American hops are grown, and it's one of the great kind of hop regions of the world. Uh, the last limited edition that we did was a gozer and um, Richie is going to tell you exactly what a gozer is. A gozer is, is one of these interesting anomalies in German brewing. Uh, there's, you know, you probably hear a lot about the Reinheitsgebot, the German brewing purity law that they're only allowed to use, uh, you know, it's not beer unless it only has barley and uh, yeast and malt and, and uh, um, sorry, yeast and malt and hops and water. Um, there are a few exceptions uh, to the rule on historical grounds, and Goza is one of them. It's a really old style before this law would have come in, uh, and it's it's from the town of Leipzig or near Leipzig anyway. And um, now it had almost completely died out before it got. It was one of these things that was kind of resurrected by the craft industry because in craft beer, unfortunately, one of the things that were kind of you know, beholden to is the fact that people just want new stuff all the time, new, new, new. And if you can find a, uh, if you can discover, I'm still waiting for you to discover some Dutch style that nobody's heard of. <laughs> if you can discover some style that nobody's heard of and then brew it, then it's great. So people realize that, you know, a uh, hundred years ago, they were brewing this beer in Leipzig that was, you know, really old. And I think with the Iron Curtain and everything, it, 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 it had completely died out and they resurrected it. Essentially, it is a sour beer made with, uh, salt. Uh, so it's it's crazy. I mean, it blows your mind if you think that this is a German beer. So salt is the ingredient that's not part of the Rheinites Gewalt. Well, also also it's it's got it's got this um, you know it, it traditionally would have been brewed with uh, a lactic bacteria, okay. which which a lot of our sour beers you know that that's a standard method for now, but it's not traditional for Germans. Um, a lactic bacteria which gives you this lactic acid uh, that really makes it sour in a kind of yogurt sour, yeah. lemon sour sort of way. Um, so it's kind of naturally soured that way. Uh, they add salt uh, to, to, the, to the boil, which is really interesting when you add salt to beer because salt, you know, we think of salt a certain way, but actually it also accentuates sweetness. Uh, it's fascinating. And then a lot of them would also have had coriander added, uh, you know, which which is standard for some of the Belgian beers and things like that. But it's a bit far out for the Germans. So, um, so it's really one of these very weird historical anomalies, and it's gotten quite popular. A lot of brewers now would make it as a base beer and then add uh, fruit puree, which would, you know, I've seen lime ones, I've seen raspberry ones. I think we did a raspberry one on a small, on a small scale, uh, but we decided to do a, a fairly straight kind of. Um, you know, unadulterated, no fruit, just the, the kind of close to the historical sort of style. The great thing about sour beers is they're so unlike normal beers. Uh, you know, they're like closer to something between a dry white wine or a dry cider. Some of the Northern French ciders are really almost sour yeah. as well. Like natural wines are kind of sour. It's, it's more like that. There's no hops in this. Um, the flavor is all kind of sourness. The only thing about this beer, it's a German beer, and um, unfortunately, I I love German beers. Germans are very good at um, at making beer. They're also very good at soccer and at football, and I still hate them for it. But anyway, cheers! <laughs> cheers. cheers. Thank you very much. <laughs> if you're interested in a brewery tour, please go to our website hopebeer.ie, and you can book a brewery tour online. <laughs>